Open your Bibles now, turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to 32. This is my annual sermon, basically, on this text. I try to bring it up uh, to date every year. But this morning I want to end this year and begin a new year with a sermon on why we are, where we are in our world today, and where we're likely to be in the very near future. For not only are we living in the final days of this age according to biblical prophecy, we're also living in the final days of this age according to the pattern of the fall of every nation or every civilization before us. Hence the title of the sermon, How to Know, How Can We Know When God Has Simply Lifted His Hand and Abandoned the Nation? How can we know that for sure? Over the next few days, we're going to be bombarded with that frivolous little phrase called Happy New Year. People are going to be verbally expressing their hope for a better life, for a brighter day, and I understand that. But if the globalists who are in charge of the world, and I say that with all due respect, the globalists who are in charge of the world, if they, if they accomplish half of what they've set out to achieve next year, 2023, even though it was filled with many challenges and many opportunities, 2023 could go down in the record books as being the last year common people enjoyed any semblance of normality. It's going to get a little tough right after the first of the year. Even the secular media right now are predicting 2024 to be a very troublesome, troublesome year uh, for all of our people. Now, prophetically, understand this, that the world is on a fast track towards the new world order. The events that Jesus just described there in Matthew 24 are happening daily. False messiahs are rising, wars, rumors of wars, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, more famines right now than ever been recorded in history. Earthquakes averaging 55 a day right now worldwide. Those are above the five on the, on the scale. When the time of tribulation begins, the Antichrist will be the leader of that new world order. Lawlessness will increase. New wars will break out, not only between nations, but also between neighbors. And yet, the gospel of Jesus Christ will be proclaimed to the ends of the world. Right after the tribulation begins, 144,000 Jewish witnesses will be released to spread the gospel all around the world. Angels will be flying through the air proclaiming the gospel. Those who refuse to be raptured, did not get raptured with the church, they will have a chance, but they're going to be, it's going to be tough times. When the great tribulation begins, as we read in the second half of Matthew 24, the Antichrist will return against Christians and Jews, demand to be worshipped as God, demand that all the people receive the mark of the beast, either in their forehead or on their hands or somewhere, some sort of symbol there. Basically, it's a sign of their loyalty to him, and those who refuse to take that sign will be martyred. Now, if you are left behind, if you know somebody else who's left behind, please get them this word. Whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever you do, don't take the mark. Because that seals your fate for all of eternity. And it will follow, you'll follow Satan into the eternal fires of hell. Three and a half years later, the sun, moon, and stars will go dark. The powers of heaven will be shaken. And those who have survived the tribulation in that day will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the great power and great glory. And of course, that will begin the end of this age and will start the new millennial age, the thousand-year reign with Christ on this earth. Now, frankly... I know this is going to break some of your hearts, but that's the only scenario Christians have to look forward to. Because uh, contrary to what many people are hoping for, maybe praying for, maybe planning for, there, will, there is no human solution to the chaos and confusion, to the outright deception and delusion in which we live today. It's beyond human remedy, or I believe somebody would have already been able to figure it out. This world is already under God's hand of judgment, but soon he will pour out his eternal wrath upon those who refuse to receive Christ as their Savior and Lord. Today we're living under the age of grace, but there will come a time when this version, this, this expression of God's grace will end. Yes, you can be saved after the trap rapture of the church, but it's a different form of grace and a different form of, of the Holy Spirit. However, and here's what I want you to hear today, and believe me on this, okay? Even before that wrath is poured out, God will send his son to get his bride, and we will be delivered from his wrath. Let me give you these passages of Scripture. Romans 5, 9. Since we have been justified by his blood, we're saved by the grace of God. 
how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Okay? And that wrath is that wrath which is soon to come against those who have not received Christ as their Savior. First Thessalonians 5, 9. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. All right? Revelation 3, 10. Jesus said these words, Because you kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those. And so that seven-year tribulation is a test of those who refuse God's grace. There's still salvation there, but it's not going to be as easy as it is today. So write those verses down, put them somewhere where you can repeat them to yourself every day, and assure yourself that, listen, one of these days it's going to be lift off, and uh, you can have my bed slippers because I'm going to go right out of them, all right? Now, I'm not a prophet, you know that. I'm not a palm reader. Uh, I'm not a soothsayer. I'm not a fortune teller. I don't read coffee grounds, and I don't read tea leaves, okay? But the Bible is the only source, my only source, of what God is telling me is going to happen in this world. But here's the problem, or here's the opportunity. Since Satan is such an envious person, uh, he, he's envious of God's glory, he has no hesitation to share his plans for the future of the world. So he's been very clear what he's going to do. And while not all of his plans come to pass, as we'll see in a moment here, because they are at odds with God's plans. Here's what I want you to understand today. Today, God is using Satan's plans and his evil schemes and his diabolical methods to accomplish his perfect will. So we're fighting, many of us are fighting, many Christians today are fighting against the very things that God is using to bring this age to a close. So we have to go through this. It's appointed unto men once to die. And we have to go through these difficult times. It's a part of bringing this age to an end. So don't get all caught up in the he said, you said, I said, they said. And don't get all caught up in the fat fire of Washington. Kind of put that aside because there are some bigger things happening in the world than what's happening in Washington. Right now pretty much Washington is irrelevant. It's Israel that you need to keep your eyes on. And a big old place over there called Russia. Those are the two places that you need to keep your eye on. So a lot of things that Satan's minions said would happen in 2023 did not happen. For example, we still have paper money. It's not worth anything, but we still have it in our back pockets. Uh, we still have gas for our cars, gas for our stoves, gas for our furnaces. The COVID-19 fiasco was not as deadly as they had planned it to be. I think seven million or something like that uh, only involved in that. The economy did not go into recession yet. It may, it may be there. We don't know it. The solar storms did not occur as they predicted. We still have electricity today. The grid was not knocked out. Uh, but as we turn to calendar number 2024, uh, prepare to hear the same old buzzwords that will cause people to live their lives in fear. I read this morning where California now is told to mask up. Well, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm from Damascus. Just don't Damascus anymore. I'm, I'm just, <laughs> don't do that, all right? But we're going to come. That's going to come today. we got another bug coming around. And I know people have the flu. People have the colds. Listen, uh, take two aspirins and call me in the morning. You'll get over it, all right? Put some lemon and some tea and, and, and just take it. And, but don't take it as a pandemic uh, as they want it. I'm not going to live my life in fear, folks. I will not live my life in fear of what somebody else says is going to happen. God's Word has already told us what's going to happen. Just trust God. But here's the point, and I, I want to be here for a while now, so pack your lunch. We are engaged in a level of spiritual warfare like the world has never seen before. Your parents didn't see it this way. My grandparents didn't see it this way. The, the immediate goal of the globalist is to bring about a one world government over which they want to rule and reign. And to achieve that goal, they need a major crisis that will cause all of the independent nations of the world to, um, to yield their sovereignty and unite for the good of the world order. For the good of the world order. For the good of the world order. You're going to hear that over and over again. Today that crisis is climate change. May I make this clear to you kids? There ain't no such thing as climate. Yes, the climate's going to change. It changes every day, for heaven's sake. It'll change before we, I mean, it was 27 degrees when I opened this building this morning. It's probably not. So the climate's changed since we've been in here. That's part of life. So understanding the saving, right now they're trying to save the planet from our destruction, but they're destroying it themselves so they can bring it back better. And here's what they want to do. They want to achieve their 17 sustainable developmental goals by 2030. It was 2021. 
And to achieve that end, they must install a Marxist socialist government organized around this idea from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. You ready for that? From each according to his ability and to each according to his needs. That's communism. Over one-third of the Gen Z Americans, those 16 to 23, say that they prefer now Marxism over um, free market capitalism. Uh, equality of outcome is what they want rather than e equal opportunity. And by the way, where did this begin? It began maybe on the sports field where everybody gets a trophy. Even those who lose gets a trophy. So nobody loses. Everybody gets a trophy. So they want equality of outcome rather than equal opportunity. The ultimate goal, the ultimate goal, now the immediate goal is the new world order. The ultimate goal of the globalist is to eradicate humanity altogether. And humanity as we know it today and replace it with the androgynous beings who are neither masculine nor, nor feminine, but who have both female and male characteristics. And now you can see why we've been through this gender dysphoria over the past couple of years. You understand the reason for the psychological conditioning you understand the reason behind the biological tampering. You understand the reason behind the cultural grooming that we've been subjected to for the last 50 years. They have destabilized, dehumanized, demoralized the traditional way of life that most of us grew up in and want to continue to live in, including, by the way, the liberty to pursue my version of personal happiness. They began with the destruction of the biblical model of the family. A man is a father, a woman is a mother, Children born into or adopted by that family. That's what the Bible describes. They want our children to be raised with the state, removing any reference to God of the Bible from their education. In other words, brainwashing them into believing that the benefits of cultural Marxism way outweigh the personal joy of individual freedom. That's the school. Now, you can understand the purpose of this controlled environment down to the itty-gimity degree even including our perception of reality, it's carefully planned, carefully managed, carefully executed to control our thoughts and to direct our decisions. And if you follow that way, you're going to be caught up in the fear factor that you'll just wring your hands, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my graciousness. The destruction of the family included the legalization of unlimited abortion, they would rather our children grow up in 15-minute cities where they are uh, captives to the sinful madness of the world rather than in the freedom of the countryside where they can at least escape and have a, a few moments of peace in the, in, and the purity of nature to sit by the stream. They want our children to be believe social media is better than human interaction. I mean, people are, <laughs> people are texting each other now in the same home. Goodness gracious. They believe that moral relativism is more inclusive than our judgmental religion. Moral relativism means you can be you and I can be me. We, we're going to get along. Over the last decade, the globalists have destroyed the very things that gave us strength and security. They've destroyed the true meaning and purpose of life. In other words, they've destroyed our faith in God or attempted to. They've um, kind of skewed the purpose of life. They've, um, they've kind of destroyed our love for the family, our dependence upon the family. The freedom to pursue, again, our personal dreams. I think that's, that's probably one of the things that bothers me more than anything is our kids don't have dreams anymore. Uh, they, they don't think about the possibilities of the future. They're told exactly what to think and where to think. Uh, see, here's why. Here's, wh here's where this is coming to. A mentally weak, spiritually immoral, emotionally unhealthy population is easier to lead into the next stage of a post-human world. We don't want thinkers anymore. They want workers. They want obedience. They want servants. They don't want to think. No, no. Don't think for yourself. Again, I don't have a crystal ball, but according to the prophecy watchers I trust, 2024 could be the pivotal year for the globalist agenda. And I don't know how it's going to start out, but I just put out this morning uh, a, a handout that I hope you'll pick up on the way out today because I just picked it up late, late yesterday at 5 o'clock. I had everything done. And I said, Lord, you know, here's what i got to say tomorrow. And all of a sudden I picked this guy's, and it almost mirrors the sermon right here. So please pick one up as you go out today. Our economic problems are worsening. Homelessness and hunger are at an all-time high. That's including 
1929 through 33. One out of five children in America will go to bed hungry tonight. One out of five. In 2022, the number of homeless people reached a record high, a record high. And with the housing prices as they are right now, I don't think it's going to get any better anytime soon. Cities all over the country have been overwhelmed by hordes of legal immigrants, five million of them who are men who seem to be equipped and ready for somebody's army. I'll just leave it there. You can pick it up outside. Um, we're on the edge of multiple military conflicts. The current war in Israel, um, it exploded yesterday into seven different fronts. Yes, there are peace workers in the behind the scenes, but now it's exploded into seven different fronts. There's a constant threat now from Iran. There's a constant threat from Russia. Uh, Turkey is getting into the play here. Watch what's going on with Turkey. Um, Last week, China warned the United States not to try to stop them from retaking Taiwan, which they probably would do after November 24. And with America being so divided as it is right now, I mean, really, we're more divided than we were prior to the Civil War passed. I I'm telling you, we're so divided right now, no matter what happens in the presidential election next year, I believe it's going to end in another bloody Civil War. And, it, and what that's going to do is increase our vulnerability to a war from the outside. And again, it, it hates, I mean, I hate to say this, it bothers me, it irritates me to say this, it's all planned. It's all planned and carried out by the order. One of the few journalists that I trust today is Catherine Herridge. And she loved, she lost several jobs, especially at Fox, because her superiors would not allow her to tell the truth about some issue or because she refused to report it the way they wanted to report it. In other words, she's an independent journalist. She's going to tell the truth. So last Sunday night, Catherine said she expected a, bland, a, excuse me, a black swan event very soon. Now, if you don't know what a black swan event is, let me tell you. It's, a, it's considered an unlikely or an unpredictable event with significant consequences. And some examples include the Wall Street crash of 1929, the Great Depression, uh, the dissolution of the old Soviet Union, the 9-11 terrorist attacks, the global financial crisis of 2008, and the most recent one was the COVID-19. It's a black swan event, and here's what it's for. I would agree with Catherine on her expectations for such an event, but I believe such events are planned and they're executed by the globalists to give people a reason for the darkness of the hour, or at least to divert our attention from the real reason and if such event does happen next year, it may very well be the prelude to World War III. And some people whom I trust believe were already there because uh, we had some battles yesterday with a couple of ships. And uh, the United States had to take, take um, um, issue there with some of the planes. Now, according to the Bible, then we are at, at the end of this age prophetically. The remaining prophecies occur after the rapture of the church and end with the return of Jesus Christ to establish his millennial kingdom. According to the level of corruption, we are at the end of the age culturally. Isaiah 5.20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light, light for darkness, bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter. That's where we live and write the opposite. Isaiah 59.14, Justice standeth afar off, for truth has fallen in the streets, and equity cannot enter. Can anybody find a court of law that will be equal justice for all, or blind justice? Not anymore. According to the history books, we are at the end of the age morally. For no civilization has survived beyond our acceptance of the sin of homosexuality. Now with the priest's blessings of whatever you, whatever you want to call that. Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome were strong militarily. But they were weak morally, and like Sodom and Gomorrah, they imploded under the weight of the multitude of sins spawned by their acceptance and agreement with uh, the sin which God calls an abomination. So with your Bibles open there this morning before you, I want just to walk down Romans chapter 1, verse 18, 32. It's a timeless passage, and um, it's divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote it, but it's divinely inspired by the Spirit of God. And here is a warning. It's a warning to individuals, it's a warning to families, it's a warning to churches, it's a warning to nations, it's a warning to the world. Here's the tick-tock down until God simply abandons 
the world like he did in Genesis chapter 6 as he abandoned all these other nations prior to us and it seems to me he's already done it here. Notice it's divided into three sections. The wrath of God is revealed, the reason God's wrath is revealed, and the results of God's wrath revealed. Number one, look at verse uh, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Back in the 1950s, and we'll study this in our Behold Your God series, A.W. <clears throat> Tozier said this, The church has surrendered her lofty concept of God and substituted one for it so low, so ignoble, as to be utterly unworthy of thinking, worshiping men. This was not done deliberately, but little by little, which only makes her situation more tragic, end quote. Perhaps the most tragic evidence of that exchange is in regards to the awareness of and the purpose of the wrath of God. You don't hear much about the wrath of God. You hear everything about the love of God, but not the wrath of God. In 2011, Rob Bell released his controversial book entitled Love Wins. If you have one, start a fire with it. Bell said here, and I quote, We do not need to be rescued from God, for God is the one who rescues us from death and destruction. Here's how a half-truth begins up becoming a whole lie. Certainly God is not only the rescuer of the lost, but he is the great pursuer of the lost. He's the great love of the lost. However, God's love is not like a high school crush on somebody. It's not like our love. In other words, God's love is not like our love. God doesn't love us because he sees something good in us and worthy of his love. Absolutely not. It's right the opposite. God loves us in spite of knowing there's nothing good in us and never will be anything good in us. That's how God loves us. Now, so rather than seeing God as being infinitely holy, even in the expression of his wrath, those who agree with Bell see God as a higher version of themselves. You see, he's just a little bit higher than we are. Well, that's, that's the problem with our view of God. If God is just a little bit higher than we are, then we don't have far to go to measure it to be equal with God. And that's where we're living. So since God created man in his image, now man has created God in man's image. And since they love who they are, they think God loves them just like they are, and there's no need to be any different. Now you might find that repulsive. I hope you do. But that's the concept of love. That's the concept of God that's being proclaimed today in the majority of churches. The ultimate evidence of God's love is the scene of his son dying on the cross for my sins and for your sins. And if there was no such thing as God's wrath, then why did God allow his son to be died, to be murdered for our sins? Why was the, what was the purpose of Christ's death if there's no wrath? Add this to the many, many, many thousands of sins of the contemporary church movement. For by not preaching the truth about the literal, physical, and eternal hell, they've given this erroneous view of God's love. In effect, they're preaching universalism, that God is so loving, so kind, that he was going to overlook our sins. He's going to allow everyone to go to heaven. He'll never send anybody to hell if there is a place called it. Eventually, God's going to save anyone, everyone, and they're going to go to heaven, whether or not they have received Christ as their Savior. That's what's being preached today. However, in Matthew 25, Jesus said this. Now, I'm not quoting somebody else. I'm quoting Jesus, okay? Matthew said this. He said, well, it's coming a day when I'm going to tell those over here, come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from before the foundation of the world. But to those on the other side, to those who refuse to receive him as their Savior and Lord, he's going to say this, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, it wasn't prepared for mankind, but it was prepared for the devil and his angels. So you have two sides. So while the unrighteous will go into everlasting punishment in hell, the righteous will inherit everlasting life in heaven. And that's the gospel truth. Now, it's not righteous because they are righteous. They're righteous because they have received the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be saved from the wrath of God. Settle down, Wayne. A day of reckoning is coming, folks, when those who refused his gift of grace will face his wrath. And what is God's wrath? What is God's wrath? Well, wrath is the outpouring of God's judgment upon those who refuse to respect his holiness. 
And we got a long way to go before we can respect this holiness. We got some learning. We got a learning curve here, even in this church, as to how to respect his holiness, especially when we come to worship. You see, unless we have the right view of God's character, which is, by the way, not just holy, but it's what? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. We cannot know the gravity of our sin, which is to reject his holiness. At this moment, we're living under the wrath of God. Those who have not received Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord are living under his eternal wrath. If they were to die this moment without Christ, they'd face their eternal wrath. Those who have received Jesus Christ as their Savior, but have not fully surrendered unto him as their Lord, we're living under those who are his remedial wrath. What, is he, what do you mean remedial? Well, God's allowing things to happen to us that won't fit right in our, <laughs> in our plans for the day. To, to try to, to bring us to our knees. All the things that he's using in the world today, the things that we're fighting and fussing against, he's doing it to bring God's people to their knees to see the futility of this world and to draw so near to him that we could feel the brush of the angels' wings as they stand before the Lord and give him glory, honor, and praise. And it may very well take an economic crash to bring the church to its knees. It may take something else to bring it, but God will bring the church to its knees. Can you imagine bringing so close to God and knowing that you're welcome there? Can you, can you imagine being so close as the song said, I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see the glory on each face. Now to complete this point, let me give you the five kinds of wrath that are illustrated in the Bible. Number one, the eternal wrath. We talked about that. That's the final judgment for those who refuse, God, refuse God's grace. Consequential wrath. Well, that's just the natural result of bad choices. Whatever we sow, that we also reap, and we also know that we reap more than we sow. Whatever we sow, that's going to reap. And this reaping is uh, it's, it's, it's passive on God's part. He doesn't do it. He doesn't um, force it. He allows it in order that we might be caught and the consequences might draw us back to him. How about calamitous wrath? Well, that's the intervening judgment of God on the whole world, as he did in, in the worldwide flood and then on specific places in the world like he did in Sodom and Gomorrah, many others eschatological wrath that's the judgment upon god the whole world during the last days revelation chapter 6 through 19 talks about that eschatological wrath this is the wrath that is yet to come and then the wrath of abandonment this is the judgment of the apostle paul here described in romans 1 18 through 32 god lifts his hand of protection from individuals from groups from nations and groups of nations and gives them over to that which has taken his place in their heart. Did you hear what I said? He gives them over to that which has taken his place in their heart. Number two, the reason God's wrath is being revealed. Pick up reading the, uh, for the wrath of God. Verse 18 again. <clears throat> well, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is in them for God has shown it to them for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they're without excuse because although they knew God they did not glorify him as God nor were they thankful but because but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So God created man in his image. Now man's created the God in man's image. So what is that specific sin that causes God to lift his hand to protection from a person, from a family, from a culture, from a nation, even a civilization? What is the sin that causes it? Look at it. The suppression of the truth about God. One more time, the suppression of the truth about God. In effect, to communicate anything less than a biblical view of a holy God. This dumbing down of God and dumbing down of Christ that we have endured for the last 40 years is now like a chicken's coming home to roost. And it's not going to be pretty. Notice Paul said God has revealed what he wants us to know about himself through how many ways? Through three ways. Natural or general revelation. That's the earth, the world in which we live, its creation, its operation, the cycles it goes through and so forth, seed, time, and harvest. <clears throat> and then through special revelation, the Bible, 
God's divine, inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. And now you understand the battle for the Bible, why they don't want it to be true. And then finally, you have the historical and glorious revelation of God in the person of Jesus Christ. So God has completely revealed himself to mankind in numerous ways. There's more evidence to prove the existence of God than any other historical event. It's in our world books and so forth. But we, when we reject that truth or we deny that truth or we suppress that truth, we do not act according to that truth. Here's what happens. We, su we, we suppress that truth to the next generation. And the downward spiral of that society begins, and I believe, this is just my conjecture here, that we began about 150 years ago on that downward spiral. <coughs> and the reason, the way we did that was through, I know if, uh, this is on my, my uh, soapbox here, but I think you'll agree, we started through the public education system about 150 years ago. But they can no longer teach now. Now we're at the point. It started slowly, but now we're at the point where they cannot teach the Bible even as history. They, they, can't, uh, they, they, they really can't support its truths regarding the creation and the operation of the earth. In other words, evolution versus creation. God's purpose for marriage and the family. Oh, no, you can't talk about that. You can't acknowledge even its moral values as the basis for our way of life, especially in America. The public education system has been bought and paid for by industrialists who want workers, not thinkers. And that's why the whole educational system has been redesigned to produce workers, not thinkers. Well, guess what? Workers can be replaced with automation. And so AI is where we're headed. Now, certainly we can point fingers at the media. We can point fingers at the entertainment industry. Why? Because they discover that sin sells. And the more sin, the more it sells. Their whole purpose then is to fan the flames <clears throat> of man's inherent desires, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And then they would promote the devil's lies regarding the nature of, of man and the needs of man and how those needs could be met, displaying the depths of man's depravity if, as if such sexual activity had no consequences. I mean, can you remember when it was uh, the lion out of the gone with the wind was taking the breath away? <laughs> can you imagine that taking anybody's breath today? You see how far we've come. Certainly we can point fingers at those involved in the field of science, teaching as truth that which cannot even pass the requirements of their own scientific method, which they set up. <laughs> you can't prove it. For example, even though it cannot be proven, the theory of evolution is now taught as accepted science. And to, differ, to, di to disagree with that, um, to, to disagree with their preferred conclusions, is no longer considered acceptable inquiry. No, no, no. You're an idiot. It, it, you're, you're exposing your ignorance if you differ with science. Uh, certainly, we can point fingers at those in charge of the culture. Where's the truth in the political arena of the day? Where's the truth in all types of advertising today? Where's the truth in news reporting today? So we're living in where truth becomes a lie. Lie becomes the truth. So we can point fingers at many other entities, but here, God did not entrust any of those entities with his truth. They can use it, they can explore it, they can explain it, and they can proclaim it, or they can deny it. But God did entrust his truth where? In the church. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, the apostle Paul told Timothy, the church is the pillar and the ground of truth. And even though we mistakenly refer to this building in which we gather as the church, Paul wasn't talking about the buildings, for God's sake. He wasn't talking about the library that's in the building. No, no, he's talking about the body of Christ, those who, who, who believe the gospel of Christ. That's the church, the body of Christ, believers from all across the world. We are the containers of truth. John 14, 6, Jesus said, He was the way, He was the truth, He was the life. Therefore, those who have received Him as their Savior and Lord and fully submitted to Him, they are the ones who have embodied that truth. You and I are the walking Bibles that the unbelieving world needs to read. And they are reading it, by the way, but it's not the Bible that God gave to us. It's the Bible we want to believe. In 1993, David F. Wells, a professor in historical and systematic theology, released his book. I couldn't put it down. It's called No Place for Truth. 1993 was when God really got a hold of me regarding the contemporary church movement, and this was the book that helped do it. He says, there's no place for truth, or the byline was, whatever happened to evangelical theology. The 300-plus page book traces the decline of theology in the American evangelical church, and he credits the rise of liberal theology 
and the lowering of the basic standards of morality by the church as the reason there's no place in today's church for the proclamation of biblical truth. This is my disagreement with the contemporary church growth movement. Has been, will be, until I die. Paul Washer said it best. He said, if you use carnal means to attract carnal people to your church, you're going to have to use even greater carnal means to keep the carnal men coming to your church. I say it this way. If you put anything out there above Jesus Christ, then that becomes your Lord. Whatever you use to attract them, if it's meals, if it's uh, fun and games, if it's a fancy speaker, if it's a, uh, lights and theater and smoke and, and all uh, other kind of stuff, if it's a coffee shop, food bar, clothing store, what, whatever you put out there, oh, we got games for kids to get them to church. If the, okay, then the games has just taken Jesus' place. Whatever you attract them with, and so if you attract them with games, you've got to keep the games. If you attract them with whatever, that's what, music, you've got to use the music. Whatever you attract them with, that's what you've got to keep going. And Jesus is the only attraction we have at Heritage Baptist Church. We preach Jesus, nothing but Jesus. You see, th there's, there, there's no such thing as liberal or conservative theology. <laughs> there's no such thing as liberal or conservative Christianity. And I would say to you, if there is such a thing, liberal Christianity is probably the greatest threat to, to the evangelical church today. You say, how so? Well, uh, many liberal Christians do not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. They do not believe that he was God in the flesh. Oh, oh he, he doesn't have to be truly God in the flesh. Just, just, we can believe that he is. And the fact that he could have been, that's all that we need to have faith in what he did. Really? How do you tell your kids that and tell them the truth? You see, they don't believe then that faith in Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. There must be some other way to heaven. So they suppress the truth, but they not only suppress the truth, but they do what? They replace it with the devil's lie. Beloved, if we do not live according to the truth that we say we believe, we're living a lie. And we're suppressing the truth from the next generation. And that describes the majority of today's churches. There's no place on their agenda for the simple exposition of gospel truth. By the time you get through all the stuff, and this is not just contemporary churches. Linda and I were between churches one time, and we several visited several churches within our hometown, and by the time they got through of talking about the men's meeting and the women's meeting and the youth meeting and the children's meeting and what happened the other day on this retreat and that retreat, it was already 15, 20 minutes into the, into the service. It was supposed to last an hour. Then you got three hymns and a chorus and take up the offering. You got about 10 minutes left for preaching. And we wonder why the church today is so biblically ignorant. That's why we don't do it here. I thank you for allowing me that freedom. I'm just not going to do it. The majority of churches today have not only stopped preaching about people's sins, now they've stopped preaching about God's wrath. They're suppressing the truth. Why? Because they love to live in their version of unrighteousness. Today's churches are focused on telling people how to use God to make their lives better. But that's the very opposite of what Jesus called his disciples to do. He said, come give up your lives. Come lay down your lives. Come forsake your personal plans and your dreams. Come and follow me. Live and follow me. Die to yourself and follow me. Let me ask you a question. Do you really think those first Christians in the first century allowed themselves to be rolled in tar, then rolled in hay, then impaled upon a pole and put up on a, uh, on a wall somewhere and used as torches to eliminate Nero's gardens at night just because they believed that Jesus was a great life coach who could help people have find a full and meaningful life? Do you really think that's the gospel? Not at all. Beloved, they had found the Savior They'd found someone who could deliver them from their sins, the one who could remove the burden of guilt from their heart and their soul. They had found the one who could reconcile them with the Father. And anything less than the preaching of that is a suppression of truth. And our children, our children are hearing the wrong things about a right God. Number three, the results of God's wrath reveal. Paul shows us the downward spiral here of a person, a family, a nation that's rejected God. And notice the farther away they run from God, the less God intervenes in their life. You would think it would be the opposite, but no, 
the, the more we turn away from him, the more he allows us to go to him. Maybe but something will draw us back, but that's not the way God works. And, and we, each step that we go, we enter into an ever-increasing darkness of depravity. Each step they take decreases their possibility of deliverance. Why? There gets a point to where you have reached the end of God's grace. Pick up reading with me in verse 24. First, God gives us up to that which is impure. Therefore, God gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Underscore that in your Bible. Why? Because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, who worshiped and served the creature. In other words, their bodies and the bodies of others became their items of worship. Well, my goodness, can you turn on the television at all without watching commercials about how to adorn the body? So they worshiped the, the creature rather than the one who created them and uh, the one who blessed them forever. So God created the body to be honored, not dishonored. In fact, God looks at our bodies as the temples of the Holy Spirit. And while we're to take care of our physical body, we are not to worship our physical body as we would worship our own God, but rather we're to use our bodies to glorify God and because they're created in His image. We don't need to do anything to our body that would reflect a negative image of God. Let me repeat that. We dare not do anything to these physical bodies that would that would neglect or negate the image in which we're created, of the one in, in, in whom we're created. God created two versions of our physical body, by the way, and only two, male and female. And the gender of those bodies cannot be altered. For to do so is to tell God he made a mistake. I don't think I want to look in the face of a holy God and say, God, you made a mistake. We're also to read, we need to be concerned about the way we adorn our bodies, for it is a sin to dress, to draw attention to our body. That's what's meant by Romans chapter 12, verse 2, when he said, be not conformed to this world. Now you have to adjust that through Scripture because, my goodness, the, the, the clothing that's to say of a prostitute changed and the hairstyle of a prostitute changed. So you can't go back and make a hard, fast rule. But do not look like the world. Don't let, let the world pursue you or press you into its styles. Now, years ago, our son got so fed up with this that he wrote Jock Penney a letter, you know, J.C. Penney. And uh, he says, please quit trying to make my little girl dress like a slut. Because the girls, at, the girls' dresses at the time had become so slutty. Men should dress like men. Women should dress like women. For in following the non-gender look, we're suppressing the truth about the unique difference between men and women, males and females, and we're giving that image to our children. Second, God has given us up to that which is unnatural. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, underscore that. For even their women exchanged their natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burn in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their era, which was due. Now, the liberal theologians today say the Bible does not condemn homosexuality. In fact, I was told this morning that the United Methodists have said that those who differ with their view now of homosexuality do not clearly understand what the Bible says. Well, I think Paul was very clear here because he used it both male and female. And uh, by the way, Paul wrote this from a city that was just engulfed in sexual perversion of every kind. It was the way of life. And by the way, included ritualistic prostitution. In other words, immorality mixed with idolatry, and they called it worship. But notice he used terms like vile passions, unhealthy, unclean, unholy, the kind of sexual activity that produced its own penalty, which was the disease that not only affected the future health of the body, but also for the soul. Why? But rather than producing the gay, carefree, happy lifestyle it portrayed, many took their own lives because of the physical pain of that disease and the spiritual emptiness that it caused and the emotional depression that it caused. This is not gay. This is not happy. This is depressing. God is not mocked, folks. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And God's calamitous judgment will be released upon those who engage in any kind of sexual activity outside of the bonds of a holy matter. Third, God has given us up to that which is dishonorable. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, oh, we can't talk about God, that's, that's divisive, we can't do that. God gave them over to a debased mind 
to do those things which are not fitting, not proper, or should not be done. And Paul, and the Greek word Paul used here for debased can also be translated as depraved. It can be translated as reprobate. And what is a reprobate mind? A reprobate mind is a mind that constantly thinks of evil only continually. You can't have a God thought. Paul describes a mind here filled with all kinds of unrighteousness, all kinds of sexual immorality, all kinds of wickedness. But notice, and I'm kind of going to change some things around here, but notice how Paul equates the sins of, listen to me, covetousness, envy, whisperers, backbiters, proud, boasters, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, as being, and being disobedient to one's parents. He equates all that with the more egregious sins of murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, haters of God, inventors of evil and violent. In other words, there's no difference. Well, if we look above that line, those are little white lines, little white sins. <laughs> that's, the, that's just living in the culture. We can get away with it. No, he equates that with murder. He equates that with hating God. He equates that with inventors of evil and violent. Paul said not only those who practice such things are deserving of death, which is the righteous judgment of God, but so are those who approve of those who practice them. We watch them for entertainment. If we use it for our entertainment, guess what? We just might as well participate in it because we're just as guilty. The former president of the SBC said this, we ought to whisper about those things which God whispers about and shout about those things which God shouts about, end quote. In other words, when it comes to such controversial issues as we've covered this morning, the best strategy, he says, is just to remain non-confrontational and just preach the gospel because God is the God of love. He's going to accept them anyway. Beloved, that is a suppression of the truth. And the reason we are where we are in the world today is because that's what the church has been doing at least for the last century. And the greatest pandemic we're facing today is the pandemic of outright lies coming from the majority of pulpits. And it's, very dan it's, a, very, ooh, it's a very dangerous thing not to tell the truth about who God is to those who are coming to hear about God. And how he's called us to live in these last days is a dangerous thing. I think of Edward's sermon of sinners in the hands of an angry God hanging over hell. And that's the way a preacher ought to, pre ought to see himself when he's preaching on Sunday morning. Are we really loving our children when we allow them to believe Satan's lie that they can live the happiness that they want by adapting their physical bodies to the gender of their choice? Are we really doing them any favors? Are we really showing our love to them if we allow them to do this? No, we're lying to them. There's no happiness on the other side of that surgery. Read the stats of yourself. Go back and research it for yourself. Take the issue of same-sex marriage. Are we really loving others when we support the normalization of the sin of homosexuality and accept same-sex couples as being equal to a heterosexual marriage? No. To do so is to allow them to question God's design of all mankind, for all mankind, and the purpose that he designed marriage, for which he designed marriage. We need to tell them the truth. Love them, but tell them the truth. Tell them the truth, what? In love. Take the issue of the watered-down gospel of easy believism. Are we really loving the sinner if we don't tell them they must receive Jesus Christ as their Savior and submit unto him as their Lord to be saved? No, to do so is to suppress the truth of God's Word regarding true repentance. And deceive the sinner into believing that they're saved when in fact they're not. And when we do that, we make them less receptive to the true gospel. Twice the sinners of hell. By not preaching the true gospel, these churches are contributing to the secularization of Christianity. And we wonder why God has lifted his hand of protection off of the world. Listen, if, if the church won't repent, how do we expect the world to repent? We're to be the leaders of the world. We're to be the salt and light of the world. And if the church doesn't repent, on what basis do we expect the world to make a change? Let me close with this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 through 12. The apostle Paul said this. The coming of the lawless one, meaning the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because, listen, why would they believe the Antichrist? Why would they believe in his lies? Why would they be deceived by the Antichrist? Because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, 
that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You know why the church will not repent? Because they're having pleasure in unrighteousness. The reason God has abandoned us today is that most people, including a majority of Christians, those who claim to be Christians, I should say, we, they're enjoying the pleasures of unrighteousness on a scale like we've never seen before since the days of Rome and Greece and Sodom and Gomorrah. To say we are born again believers and yet live like unbelievers is to suppress the truth from those who are lost and need to see a Savior. Should God call us home today, would he find us saturated with the truth? Walking in his truth, helping others find the truth, or claiming to know the truth, but in our everyday lives we're actually, we're actually suppressing that truth. Now, unless I'm wrong, the Holy Spirit may have prompted you this morning are you suppressing the truth? Or are you proclaiming the truth? Are you walking evidence of that truth? Or are you suppressing that truth? Are you, are you living up to what you say? A friend of mine used to say, we live exactly what we believe. The rest is just routine religion. Spurgeon said it this way, the cross to a sinner is like a lighthouse to a ship at sea. In other words, when you and I look at the cross, we see it, yes, as emblem of suffering and shame, but we also see it as an emblem of God's love and God's grace. But listen, a sinner needs to see the cross as a warning because Jesus was on that cross, not for himself, but for those who needed a Savior. And if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, that cross is not, it, it is an emblem of suffering and shame, but it's also a warning of what is headed for you if you continue to rebel against the Lord. For if God did not spare his only son who was being crucified for my sins, he certainly will not spare the lives of those who refuse to believe in him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we have to trust you because we have no other place to turn. There's no other way to be saved except to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other way of having eternal life except to receive the eternality of Christ's life within us to die to ourselves, that Christ may live his life in us, and that's eternal life. And so, having trusted you now with our eternal life, we can trust you with the days of our lives, and, and we can say, here I am, Lord. I will go wherever you lead me. I will go wherever you need me. I'll go wherever you send me. I will say whatever you need me to say. I will do whatever you need me to do. As long as you give me breath, I will praise your name. I will do my best to live according to that which I say I believe so that I not be a hypocrite. And I will do whatever I can not to suppress the truth in which you've trusted to me. Father, would we, I pray, every, every member of this church would say that today. I'm going to live out the truth that you've entrusted to me. The truth about Jesus, the truth about salvation, the truth about his grace. Father, would you draw someone away from that eternal hell today and would you assure them of their rightful place in heaven? the place that's been prepared for them way before the foundations of the world. Lord, would you speak to my heart today? Would you speak to the heart of everyone here, those who's listening to my voice at whatever time they're hearing? Have your will and your way. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.